their mistakes, Percy, with mistakes in Italians. Or in Italians. With in Italians. God. <laughs> with their mistakes. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I am the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a grown man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I am now reading them as an adult to determine if this is a book series that we've all been sleeping on. This quest, though, is not one that I am on alone. I am joined by the same guest as the last episode, the same wonderful person, podcaster, writer, producer, the co-creator of Unseen, Wolf Through 59, Zero Hours, Time Bombs, so many wonderful things. It's Sarah Shackett. Sarah, how's it going? Hi, it's good. I have refilled my Ithaca glass that no one on this podcast can see, but <laughs> I brought references. I'm here. Good. Amazing. Is it just an Ithaca College and Ithaca New York mug? It's Ithaca Beer Co., Ooh. Where they have good beer. I have one of the mugs that is designed to look like those cups from the 90s with the teal and purple squiggles. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the energy I'm bringing today. Amazing. <laughs> but it's not a paper thing. It's an actual mug because environmentally friendly. Yay. Woo! Use mugs. So we are here to discuss chapters four and some of chapter five, potentially, given how this goes, of Percy Jackson in the Sea of Monsters, a.k.a. the Cove of Crankies, a.k.a. so many other names. Let's get right into it, unless you have anything else to say about what we're, where we're going, where we're at. I mean, it seems we're bad. Everything seems bad. So I relate to this content. Yeah, it's not a great place to start in that we already knew there was something bad happening at camp. And we just had a very bad ride that made me very stressed on many levels because I definitely got motion sickness a lot as a kid, mainly because I think I was always in the back seat and I always do better in the front seat of cars. So maybe that's it. But also as a kid, I would usually try to play my Game Boy or read a book in the back seat. Uh -huh. And anytime I'm looking down, that gives me a problem. Even to this day, if I'm in a car looking down on my phone or something. Yeah. It's just rough. I learned very quickly that like I'm fine in cars until I'm like trying to read or like play a game in a car. And then it's very bad. Yeah. Even on the phone, sometimes I've gotten better about like trying to angle my phone up so that I yeah, don't like yeah, destroy yeah. my spine. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, I can handle editing a podcast on a laptop in a car and not get motion sickness. I've done that over multiple road trips of sorts. Nice. And I'm okay, and especially if it's highway driving. Highway driving, no big deal. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, that's it's just straight. Especially highway driving in Texas when you're just you're just going and you're going 70 and no one is stopping that's you. That's just what's happening. It's good stuff. So chapter four is called Tyson Plays with Fire. And this is a chapter title that has kind of already played on stuff we've seen before yes. with these giant wiffle balls of death. But now we're uh, we're seeing, OK, Tyson, his non burned hands weren't just a fluke, perhaps. So my initial prediction when I started this chapter is that Tyson is the son of either a fire god or a creature that either uses fire as a nobility or is fire resistant. I do not know enough about creatures to make a guess here. Previously, I have thought Maybe some sort of giant, maybe some sort of cyclops, because I know they're big and they're on the cover of this book. So that's a pretty easy guess. Also, maybe some sort of demigod, and he's going to find out he belongs to one of the other cabins. Who's to say? Who is to say besides Rick? Yeah, I was going to say, Rick Riordan is to say in a couple of pages. <laughs> so this chapter opens so powerfully. Quote, Mythologically speaking, if there's anything I hate worse than trios of old ladies, it's bulls. <laughs> Just incredible. It's an incredible sentence. It's so good. And it's such a perfect way to make a joke that all of the readers get instantly. Absolutely. Because if you've read book one, you go, oh, yeah, Furies and the Grey Sisters, boom. And then Minotaur and what we're about to see here. That makes sense. And as is the point of this line, when I was reading this, I go, ah, a giant bull is attacking. <laughs> so there are two bronze bulls the size of elephants that can breathe fire. And those mm -hmm. are the beasts that are attacking the campers. Very scary. The Gray Sisters immediately just Bounce. skirt, skirt out of there. They just drive 
as fast as they can pedal to the metal. They don't even ask for the extra three drachmas. Nor would I. They just leave immediately. Percy isn't worried most by the bulls or the, quote, 10 heroes in full battle armor getting their bronze-plated booties whooped. Bronze-plated booties is a very good name if you are at a Percy Jackson trivia night. Yep. The bronze-plated booties would be very fun. That would be incredible. The alliteration is great. Yes. Or the bronze-plated booty whoopers something. This was a fun little description. Yeah. But what worries him most is not these things. It is that the bulls are over the hill past the boundary of Thalia's tree. That is very scary because now we know it's not just an attack on camp, which we've seen before. Something is wrong with camp. Camp has been compromised. Yes, (laughs) that is not what we want to see. No, not at all. Percy overhears someone shout border patrol to me, which he finds odd since... There is no border patrol. Annabeth says that it's Clarice and they have to help her. And narrator Percy says, this uh, wouldn't normally be high on my to-do list, but she is in trouble. So what are you going to do? Exactly. Heroes are not holding up very well here, including someone with a plume of their helmet on fire, running in circles, screaming. And if this is not in the movie, I will break (laughs) the DVD in half because come (laughs) on, that is so funny. And you have to show such a good image. (laughs) That would be me, by the way. That would entirely be me in any kind of combat scenario. (laughs) I would be the math kid who hid behind the mat. That would be me. I would be trying to leave the situation without anybody noticing. (laughs) Percy uncaps Riptide, tells Tyson to stay back, but Annabeth says they need him, which is a shock to Percy. And again, I was thinking... The chapter titles Tyson plays with fire. We've seen Tyson do well with fire. These bulls are spitting fire. Annabeth knows something. Annabeth to Percy says, quote, Percy, do you know what those are up there? The Colchis bulls made by Hephaestus himself. We can't fight them without Medea's sunscreen SPF 50,000. We'll get burned to a crisp. I need to ask Dr. Moy about what are both of these things. I'm not going to tell you because it will come up in an interstitial episode, but I just promise these references and the way that Rick modernizes and weaves them into it, it's very funny. It's very, very funny. And it is still done in a way where I still laughed at the concept of SPF 50,000, even though I have no idea what Medea's deal is. Right. I very much appreciate, and this is something that I love about Rick, is that if you know even a little bit about Greek mythology, you can think, oh, this is fun and cute and clever. But he weaves it in in such a way that if you don't understand the mythology, you don't feel left out in any way. Cough, James Joyce, cough. Ha ha, yeah, I totally know what James Joyce has written. <laughs> Uh, Many books in which he uses lots of Greek references, and then there are books that you buy to understand all of the Greek references. It's very bad. Oh, no, I don't like that. You shouldn't have to have a reference guide (laughs) to enjoy a book. (laughs) Read Ulysses if you want, or don't. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) So Percy asks, and this feels like a very New York thing. Percy asks, Medea's what? Which I feel like is such a Northeast New York thing is to... Say one word of the thing you don't understand and then ask the what or the who or whatever. I think it's a very authentic way. No, someone from like the Midwest or the South would say, excuse me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very good. That's very good. But yeah, I, specifically, I feel like an authentic New York thing is to say one of the words you heard, yeah. even if you mispronounce it, and then say the what or the who or the where or whatever. So I love this. That is also the correct question to ask here, because what is SPF 50,000 even mean? Percy tells Annabeth that he is not going to let Tyson get charred, tells him to stay back, and rushes in. Annabeth tries to interject at one point, meaning that she 5,000% knows what Tyson's deal is. Yep. Clarice then forms a phalanx, and Annabeth taunts a bull, and then she goes invisible to confuse it, and it does work, but the other bull goes for the phalanx. And we get a description of this bull. It is huge. It has rubies for eyes, and its horns are silver. This bull sounds really cool. I know I'm not supposed to like it, but this bull sounds really cool. (laughs) It's not in Hades the video game, but it would be a great boss in Hades the video game. It would be, and I think you have just won the award of first guest to ever reference Hades the video game on an episode before I did, and we didn't (laughs) reference it last episode. Oh my gosh. (laughs) 
<laughs> Incredible. <laughs> so many people just lost in TNO bingo in the last episode. But yes, this would be good. I guess you do fight the Minotaur, yeah. but you don't fight this guy. That would be a fun... I'm assuming at some point they're going to make DLC. They have to, right? I think it would be fun to do some sort of battle dome where you keep fighting just bosses where it's just boss fight after boss fight as opposed to the way the video game normally works, which is you fight a bunch of little guys and then you go into boss fights. I think it would be fun just to the equivalent of didn't Hercules have to fight a bunch of big people or someone did, right? Yeah, there's the 12 labors in like mythology. And then there's like in Hercules, the cartoon, there's like this wonderful montage where he deals with hydras and minotaurs and all sorts of stuff. Right. So I think fighting these, what are they? Not the tchotchke bulls. What are they? The colchis bulls. The colchis bulls. Thank you. (laughs) Which is, it's cool because it is like a real region kind of where the modern day country of Georgia is now. Oh, cool. Yeah. So this is one thing I love about Percy Jackson that it shares with Greek mythology is that sort of using of, because, you know, you and I live in New York City. It's a real place that mm-hmm. gets destroyed in every Marvel movie ever. Uh-huh. And also there's something about like sort of blending the fantastical and like real world stuff that's really cool that Percy Jackson does. And lots of other things do like comic books and Greek mythology. Yeah, I think it's fun. Shout out to the country Georgia who almost single handedly got Zaza Pachulia into the all-star game, even though he's not that great at basketball, (laughs) but he's from the country of Georgia and the entire nation decided, hey, let's just vote for this guy. Let's just get behind him. (laughs) And it almost worked. And he's part of the reason why they adjusted the rules of what percentage of fan votes determine NBA All-Stars. So you did it, Georgia the country. (laughs) It's always better, I think, slightly when you force a rule change in something. Yes, That's how you know you've really made your mark on something. Exactly. If you're an athlete and you're too good that they have to change the rules. If you're Simone Biles and they've decided we cannot give you points for this thing. We can't score this properly. Yeah. Your thing that you are physically (laughs) able to do is too difficult for everyone else to do. So you're not allowed to do it. If you've gotten to that level in whatever profession you're at, you know you've done very well for yourself. Absolutely. Good on Georgia. Good on Georgia. So. The confused bull, unfortunately, loses interest in its quest for Annabeth, and it charges after the phalanx as well, and it's flanking the phalanx, so that's not good. Percy tries to warn Clarice in the phalanx, but unfortunately, that does more harm than good, because it startles Clarice, and then bull number one wrecks the phalanx, and then bull number two comes in for the kill on Clarice. Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. Percy does save Clarice, though, by yanking her out of the way. And while he does so, he also slashes the bull with Riptide. It doesn't do much damage, but he still lands a hit. Annabeth then starts to tell the heroes to spread out and to keep the bull distracted. Bull number one then makes a big arc when turning back to fight Percy. And when it's past the boundary that it shouldn't be able to cross, it struggles a bit as if it's running through the wind. That's good. At least there's something going on. Exactly. That was a bit of relief for me reading yeah. this, thinking, okay, it is kind of working. Things aren't going perfectly, but it's not completely defeated. There's some semblance of a defense up here. Yeah. Bull number two, though, the now slashed bull, starts to head towards Percy, and it looks quite perturbed due to the aforementioned slashing. Percy is feeling tired and out of practice. He realizes he hasn't had to use Riptide. Hasn't come up in PE, huh, Percy? No, I guess not. They're not doing (laughs) any sort of sword training in this school. (laughs) So he is able to dodge out of the way of a charge flame attack, but not super well. He feels the heat of it. It hurts. He does cut off part of bull number two's snout, but when he lands, he tweaks his ankle. None of this feels good. Even the incremental successes do not feel good. No, you can tell he's a bit rusty. You can tell he's out of practice and he tries to walk on his injured ankle and it's bad he can't really put a lot of weight on it it might even be broken never a fun situation to be in no bull number one starts to charge at percy and he knows i am not going to be able to crawl away from this this is not good for me annabeth shouts for tyson to help him and that just completely means he has a role here he is not just a random kid tyson says that he can't get past the barrier 
And Annabeth shouts in a very professional, official-sounding way. Because she's totally done this. She's done this before. I, Annabeth Chase, give you permission to enter camp. And thunder roars. And Tyson gets in between Percy and the bull just as it blasts fire at Percy. And before he jumped in, Percy tried to yell no, telling him not to do this because Percy's a hero. But immediately after it works, Percy just yells, Tyson? (laughs) In shock. (laughs) Relatable. Incredibly relatable. The flame completely surrounds Tyson, but he is completely unharmed. Mm -hmm. And very surprisingly, even his clothes are fine, which is something we have seen with demigods before we've at least seen percy's clothes not get wet so this made me start to think okay maybe he is more of a demigod here because it's not just that tyson is fire resistant it goes beyond just the person it's a good thought Uh, we'll see if it's right (laughs) yeah no but i i like that there's you know we don't have a lot to go on it's like a sherlock holmes problem where the actual clue is something that just isn't mentioned in the story so i like that you're pulling from just everything that we know and like pattern matching. It's good, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I've gotten better at guessing what happens next, and I'm trying to logic as much as I can here. But ultimately, I do feel like I threw out a lot of guesses for Tyson. So even if one of them ends up being correct, which we'll see, I'm not going to take a a big leap around (laughs) the studio here because I threw out so many possibilities. (laughs) So the bull is very surprised, as is Percy. And then Tyson punches the bull in the face, and he screams, bad cow. Uh, I like when Tyson gets stuff just a little bit wrong. I know. It's very fun. It's like Tyson is designed to be endearing anyway. I feel for him and like want good things for him always. But when he does stuff like that where it's just a little bit wrong and he's showing some agency, then he becomes my favorite person in the books. Yes, and that's when I think it works better because we'll see with Tyson... It is towing the line of him being endearing and not knowing what's going on. And sometimes him coming off as a complete buffoon, which I don't like as much. And I'll have to learn about how the lore of Percy Jackson all shakes out. But that's something I didn't necessarily find great about the Harry Potter universe is just, oh, this class of being is not intelligent. And just to put a big blanket over it, just because, yeah. oh, they are big, whether it's the giants or the trolls, the bigger people are not as are smart. Stupid. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a very fun trope. So I think that at times it doesn't completely work for Tyson. But for the most part, like you're saying, it does seem to work out pretty well. And when he does have agency, exactly as you put it, That's more fun. And it's more fun for him to get stuff wrong just in that he doesn't know exactly what he's fighting. A bull is close enough to a cow where you're not super right, you know, not super wrong. But that stuff is more fun than him calling Annabeth pretty and trying to touch her hair. I think it's more fun when he just doesn't 100% understand everything that's going on. It's normal. This is, I'm assuming, All new to him. I would guess he has not met a pair of bulls with ruby (laughs) eyes that can shoot flames up before. I would be surprised. That would be a very surprising pair of folks to meet. So Tyson absolutely wrecks the bull. He beats its snout in so badly that flames come out of its ears. And this better be in the movie. Come on. That is just Looney Tunes comedic gold. Give it to me. And then the bull stumbles, it staggers, and it flails in defeat. Annabeth gives Percy some nectar, and he starts to heal, and the narrator Percy says, quote, There was a burning smell that I later learned was me. The hair on my arms had been completely singed off. Does not sound like a good feeling. Don't like that at all. Mm -mm. I'm glad that he went into shock and didn't feel that. That's good. (laughs) Yeah, because, ugh, not pleasant. Percy asks Annabeth about bull number two, and Annabeth points, and Percy now sees that Clarice took care of it with her spear. Good on Clarice. Yeah. She stomps over and she tells Percy that he ruins everything (laughs) and she had it under control. She did not. (laughs) Percy might ruin everything. He does ruin some stuff. He ruins lots of things, but Clarice also opens herself up to things being ruined. I'll put it that way. Yes. And she certainly did not have this under control. (laughs) No. The response to Clarice saying this, though, from Annabeth is perfect. She says, quote, good to see you too, Clarice. (laughs) 
It's so good. It's so great. Annabeth is perfect. <laughs> when Clarice yells that they should never try to save her again, Annabeth reminds her that there are wounded campers, so maybe instead of being rude to us, you should go help people out. And that does snap Clarice out of it, so she goes to check on them. So I do appreciate Clarice becoming less of just the bully that we're not supposed to like. Yeah. A Clarice redemption arc, I think, would be very fun. I think it would be very fun to see someone who started as a bully, who's just rude to Percy for the sake of being rude to Percy. If she eventually becomes a friend, I think that's very fun. Because that is not something we got with Draco Malfoy at all. His redemption arc is too little too late, for sure. Yes. So to have her be the supreme bully in book one and... Seemingly the kind of bully, at least so far in book two, if by book five she's a friend, that would be so fun. Yeah, usually it's too little too late and it will just like, oh, we're offering you context. But the amount of mean things they have done so far does not balance out the context. (laughs) So, yeah, I think it would be great for us to sort of learn what's going on with Clarice and also like to see moments like this where she is not just a cartoon bully. She cares about the people on her border patrol and is trying to be a good leader. It's just the way she's going about that often clashes with the way Percy goes about things. Mm -hmm. And it would be very fun to see if the way that Percy and Clarice become on the same side is through a heart to heart real conversation. Maybe I'm just skewed because I watched Encanto this past weekend. Oh, nice. But but similarly to how Louisa, the big strong one, has this very honest moment where she talks about her feelings, and this is surprising. If we get a scene of Clarice talking about her feelings, oh my goodness, that would be incredible. I would be so here for that. I Without spoiling anything. You have such a hard job. I'm so grateful. I'm doing my best. I will just say, Mike, I love that you're thinking in this way and that there is Clarice content ahead. Cool. That is good to know. It is funny because in these episodes, especially in book one, the guests have all done a very good job of not spoiling anything for me. And it's fun, especially if I will read things after the fact or people will message in a way that is not spoiling. But there was a particular episode I did with Stephen Parra. People said, oh, wow, the five instances where Stephen Parra made some sort of reference that didn't spoil Mike was really funny. And I was like, five? Like, no way. (laughs) I had no idea. So the guests are doing a very good job of going over my head. So we'll just have to see. But I think that'd be very fun. Yeah. Percy is still just completely flummoxed by the entire Tyson situation. He just stares at Tyson and says, you didn't die. Tyson looks down as if he was embarrassed, and he says, I am sorry, came to help, disobeyed you. Ugh, Mm -hmm. Tyson, Mm -hmm. you gentle soul. Uh, Uh. (laughs) Ugh. Just all of the blankets, all of the chamomile tea. I want all of them. Give them all to Tyson. My big, tall friend. (laughs) (laughs) Annabeth tells Percy to look at Tyson and to really look at Tyson through the mist. And Percy remembers, oh, yeah. The mist doesn't just fool mortals, it can fool demigods too. And that's when he realizes that Tyson isn't just hard to look at because he has stuff stuck in his teeth. He realizes that the mist has been obscuring Tyson's face and that Tyson is actually a Cyclops, which, okay, I have now learned that Cyclops, we knew they existed in the Percy Jackson universe. Yep. I'm assuming he is demi-Cyclops or at least a very much baby Cyclops, and he will eventually become full-fledged giant. But from my understanding, from what we've learned about Cyclops so far, is that they are absolutely huge. So either Tyson is three, or (laughs) one of the parents is not a Cyclops. We will see what happens. But so far, we at least know he's got one eye, and unfortunately, this one eye has tears coming down of it. He's crying. (laughs) Tyson, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's so devastating. Tyson was already incredibly huggable, but now that he's crying, it's just, come here. It's going to be okay, Tyson. Everything's going to be okay. (laughs) Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Annabeth says, a baby, by the looks of him, probably why he couldn't get past the boundary line as easily as the bulls, Tyson's one of the homeless orphans. And Percy says, one of the what? And Annabeth says, they're in almost all the big cities. They're mistakes, Percy, with mistakes in Italians. Or in Italians. In Italians. God. <laughs> They're mistakes. They're <laughs> mistakes in italics. <laughs> she continues, children of nature spirits and gods, 
Well, one God in particular, usually, Mm -hmm. and they don't always come out right. No one wants them. They get tossed aside. They grow up wild on the streets. I don't know how this one found you, but he obviously likes you. We should take him to Chiron. Let him decide what to do. So at least this confirms, okay, when Annabeth asked if he was homeless, she wasn't being a jerk. No. She was confirming that he is one of these orphans. But now I'm very curious as to the true origin of Tyson. We get that he's a Cyclops, but I really want to know his exact lineage. What nature spirit? What god? Was it just a Cyclops? Is it not even a Cyclops? Is it just from other people? I was very confused here because now we know he's a Cyclops, but it feels like it could be, and I can't believe this is the second time I've referenced this on the News Olympian, it could be the SpongeBob Sponge Plus Starfish equals clam question mark right. or Mr. Krabs and whoever Mrs. Krabs is equals whale of it might not even be that one of his parents or both of his parents are Cyclops slash is a Cyclops. It could just be one of the gods plus one of the spirits equal Cyclops. So that's usually how it works. If you go and sort of read sort of how monsters get made some of them just appear okay but some of them it is just sort of like god plus spirit equals Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i've talked through this reading this quote again but as we discuss chapter five this is going to potentially influence my thoughts about what the actual title of chapter five is referring to for context i have not finished chapter five i have only read the first beginnings of it because i counted the number of pages in it Eight. and read just enough because i do think this podcast is more fun when i do not know what's happening next so i wanted to read enough to have content for the episode but not too much where if there's a plot to us i don't know what's going on so i do not know at this point in time what tyson's legitimate lineage is but I'll get to this and when we learn what the chapter title of chapter five is. Yeah, but we're getting to it. this conversation is now bubbling up some new thoughts, which is very exciting for me. Nice. Especially to have them live because some folks have reached out and I do have a very helpful email where someone said, here are all of the things in the upcoming books you should record live for a live reaction. So <laughs> I will have to consult this list. A couple of people actually said it through. I'm going to get my phone voice memo mode and try to do some of those as long as I remember them. Oh, that's so fun. So that could be very fun. I did do that for one point with Harry Potter when Molly Weasley says, not my daughter, you I did get audio of me going, no way, you can do that, which uh, I didn't think you could curse in Harry Potter books. Oh, wow, I had to bleep myself. First time I've been bleeped on the podcast. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, congratulations. (laughs) Continuing after she's described this, they want to go to Chiron. Percy says, but the fire, how? And Annabeth explains the fire of it all. He's a cyclops. And then Annabeth pauses as if she is remembering something unpleasant She says, they work the forges of the gods, they half in italics, to be immune to fire. That's what I was trying to tell you. So this makes sense. And now I'm thinking, okay, it doesn't mean that he has to be the child of a fire-related god just because he is a cyclops. That is why he's good with fire. Right. It is a quality that cyclopses have, not necessarily an inheritance from his parents. Exactly. Exactly. Percy doesn't have time to think about it, though, because there are campers to help and there are bulls to dispose of, quote, which I didn't figure would fit in our normal recycling bins. Uh, <laughs> Love Percy. that camp half-blood recycles. I bet they compost, too, and everything. <laughs> oh, they for sure compost. Oh, they just their composting is just burning offerings to the gods. That's or true. Or would the gods get upset? They go, banana peels. <laughs> Eggshells. Someone made that mistake once and then never again because right, right. you have to keep them very separate. <laughs> Shout out to composting. Shout out to everyone who does compost. I lived in Seattle for two years, which means I composted a lot and I still compost in New York. I have a compost bag in my freezer and there's a park near us that does composting. They have compost buckets there hey. every day. It's very nice. Shout out to composting. Everyone should do it. It's not that hard and uh, it's good for the world. Clarice says that they need to bring the wounded back to the big house and let Tantalus know what happened. Percy and I ask, who's Tantalus? And Clarice says that that's the activities director. Percy and I say, no, that's Chiron. (laughs) And he then asks also, where's Argus? Because he's supposed to be head of security. Clarice says that Argus was fired? Yep. Which, oh no. (laughs) And when Percy is unable to process Chiron being gone, because yes, that doesn't make any sense to me, 
Clarice points to Thalia's tree and says, that, in italics, happened. And the description here to close out chapter four, not ideal. The needles of the tree are yellow, and there is a puncture hole in the tree that is oozing green sap. And Percy puts it together. The borders are failing because the tree is dying. Someone has poisoned the tree. Oh, no. Don't like this at all. That's the end of chapter four. And this is another great natural transition for us to go into the lightning brief, where we're going to talk about fun updates of the podcast and also where you can get sweet deals on stuff. Yay. (laughs) Oh, no, the tree. Let's ignore the tree and instead talk about cool things. Cope with it by buying things. (laughs) Retail therapy. Use the promo code, whatever I say it is. Hello and welcome aboard to the Sea of Sponsors. I don't have any big announcements here. I just wanted to thank everyone for sharing the show. I've been seeing new folks finding the podcast and folks finding it in new and different ways. People saying that they found it because people recommended it to them or because they saw someone posting about it. There's been a bunch of threads on different Percy Jackson subreddits and people posting on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and stuff that I've seen. And I just really, really appreciate everyone who has taken the time to share the podcast because word of mouth is such an incredible way to share a podcast, especially if you reach out to someone directly. So the fact that a lot of you folks have done that to help the podcast grow is really cool because I love seeing the communities grow, whether it's the Facebook groups or the Discord or the Patreon or seeing different interactions on social media like Twitter and Reddit. It is so much fun to see this thing grow and see more and more people discover the show and start from episode one and then get caught up. It's really fun and none of that would be possible without all of you, folks who've left reviews on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. All of these things just absolutely warm my heart and they help the show, and I'm so appreciative to all of you. So thank you so much. And I'm also very appreciative to the folks who are supporting the show on Patreon. If you go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon, you can get access to a bunch of fun bonus content. For example, the most recent bonus episode that I posted was me reading every other page besides the main text in The Lightning Thief. So I went through things like the intro and the about the author, and then I found a Lightning Thief teaching guide that Rick put together and put on his website, and I went through the teaching guide and did some discussion questions with myself. It was very fun and there's lots of goofy other things that you can get access to if you go to the newstolympian.com slash Patreon. But I want to thank the folks who have joined most recently. So shout out to our newest mega god tier patrons, Kaylee Holder and Milo Kim. Shout out to our newest god tier patrons, Hey Lady, I'm a Leo, Ali Buono, Porpoise Fear, Liz May, and a happy birthday to Simone Soriano. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Liz Hefferman and AIM. And also a belated oops, somehow I missed your name, Patreon shout out to the one and only Jilly Mac. If you are someone who has not had your name read and you've been joined for over two weeks, please shoot me a message on Patreon. Sometimes Patreon doesn't give me the notification, especially if you did support Potterless at one point in time. So shoot me a message and I'll make sure I thank you in the episode. But thank you to all the patrons. I hope that Hermes guides all of your emails to be sent in a very quick manner and with no sorts of weird bounce back errors. And before we wrap up here, just going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in Fiji, don't be surprised if you hear a Fiji-relevant ad. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The News Olympian. And we're back. Hopefully you bought something and made yourself happier. You don't have to have bought anything. You just listening is the only support I need. Yeah, the tree, man. That's still... Oh, it I sucks. Oh, that really sucks. Ugh. Unless this is the kickstarting event to get Thalia out of, out the, of tree, the tree, right. which I am predicting will happen, that could be net good. But tree, which protects the camp, being poisoned, very bad. I don't like that at all. Not very good. It's so funny, and it shows, I think, the effectiveness of this writing, that I could be so sympathetic towards a tree. <laughs> like Just on paper, tree's not doing well. Especially for me, someone whose plants in my apartment die all the time for unknown reasons. You just come home and you see, oh, this plant has decided to give up. What did I do wrong? Did I overwater you? Did I underwater you? I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Right. And I think nothing of it. But now a tree is in danger and I'm heartbroken. (laughs) It feels very summer camp to me Mm. of if you are spending a lot of time like at a summer camp and there's like the circle where all of the... um, campfire songs are sung and then there's like the one tree that's hangs out in the field it's like you do get attached to the natural world in a slightly different way from you know the way that we all sort of live in our everyday lives so that feels very summer camp to me yes and it's not even just summer camp in that the tree is always there or it's a central location 
the tree does serve a purpose for the camp. Right. It's part of the camp. Right. It is intrinsically intertwined with the camp. Everyone knows about the origins of the tree, so it's sad on that regard. Mm -hmm. There's many different layers to why this is terrifying, and I think it's testament to how good Rick Riordan is at writing the series is I am so invested in a tree and a character we've only learned about via exposition. Yeah. We haven't even truly met Thalia yet, but I think it just shows, <laughs> and this happened in book one. I loved Sally. She was around for two to three pages yeah. <laughs> before she got yanked out of there. Probably more than that, but not even two chapters. And when Sally got gold yeeted out of there, I thought, no, Sally, I love you. <laughs> I love you. Bring your cookies back. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> It's a neat trick, and it often shows up, I find, like, in epic stories. Like, Ooh, the okay. opening of Star Wars is just R2 and 3PO screwing around. Mm -hmm. And you care about this blue and white tin can so much that then you transfer that carrying on to the Death Star plans, which are amorphous and mean nothing. Right. And even a very niche reference, last night I watched Inside Lewin Davis, a very good Oscar Isaac film, hey! especially if you are a creator who's ever struggled with making it. But if you don't want to feel feelings, don't watch it. It's for free if you have Amazon Prime Video, at least on January 21st, 2022. In that, there is a cat that goes missing, and you don't know the cat for very long. And when it goes missing, immediately I was screaming, no, the, not the cat! It's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. <laughs> it's so devastating. And I am not a pet person at all. I'm very anti-pet person. Like, hot take levels of not liking pets. So for me to be caught up in a cat being missing, yeah. <laughs> so now we're into chapter five. Chapter five is called I Get a New Cabin Mate. And that is a chapter title that on its surface seems very innocuous. And yet. But given the implications, this could be huge. Yep. This could be enormous because there's three options here. One there's another child of Poseidon here that just gets dropped on us that we haven't met before. Just, oh, hey, while you were gone, another kid got claimed by Poseidon. Meet Barry. <laughs> Two, it's some sort of misdirect. And this is a situation where Percy just has to bunk with someone. Maybe Tyson is scared. So Percy spends a night in the Hermes cabin. I don't even know if he's allowed to do that or not. He brings the bulls in there. Something right. happens. This is some sort of not actual cabin mate. Or 3A, Tyson gets to sleep in cabin 3, either by technicality. Or 3B, Tyson is the son of Poseidon. I had written this originally in my notes as a joke. But now rereading Annabeth's quote and thinking it could be anyone, there is a chance, and I do not know the answer yet, there is a chance that Tyson, even though he's a Cyclops, is the son of Poseidon and some other nature god of sorts. And we know that Poseidon is a bit of an F-boy. We do know so, that. So uh, completely plausible that oh, yeah. he would get it on with some sort of nymph. So that's a possibility. But also, again, I think this just gives so much credit to Rick is that he knows exactly what he's doing at all points. And the simple chapter title of I Get a New Cabin Meet, which seems, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. You get a roommate. Me, I was going through an existential crisis <laughs> <laughs> trying to think, what could it mean? So it's really solid writing there It's because it, it could be any of these things. That's what makes it strong is that it gives you the sense that an answer is incoming, but it could be so many things. And that's where, you know, the murder board comes in. <laughs> that's fun for us, too. Yes, we are all... Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny with all yep. the yarn pointing everywhere. Yep. Trying to figure it out. And Rick knows it. And he's done enough misdirects in the first book that it is completely plausible that it is not big stakes, but also it could be huge stakes. And even as you think that this chapter title, just the title is powerful, you also get a very powerful intro. Narrator Percy says... Ever come home and found your room messed up? Like, <laughs> I, said that, I said that like a bad infomercial. Ever come home and found your room messed up? Like some helpful person. So, I, I should read this no, uh, no, no, authentically. No, 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 it's fine. Ever I, come I, home. I'm waiting for the 1-800 number. <laughs> the ShamWow. Ever come home and found your room messed up? Like some helpful person, in parentheses, hi, mom. Incredible. Oh, oh amazing. 
has tried to quote unquote clean it and suddenly you can't find anything. And even if nothing is missing, you get that creepy feeling like somebody's been looking through your private stuff and dusting everything with lemon furniture polish. That's kind of the way I felt seeing Camp Half-Blood again. That's a very accurate description Mm -hmm. for me. I think that's something I felt in home life, in work life, when I had an office desk and something is just slightly off from how you left it. It could be something completely innocuous. Someone was cleaning. Someone accidentally bumped into your chair or whatever, and they hit something else. But I don't know. I didn't leave my mug there. (laughs) What were people doing? (laughs) It's such a common and such like a visceral experience. Like it's so... Powerful. And then he doesn't have to actually describe Camp Half Flood because we just understand the feeling. And also, mm-hmm. I love that like Percy's voice as a narrator is so strong that there can just be a parenthesis, hi, mom. Yep. And it doesn't like break anything. It's just yeah. funny. I love it. It's just very funny. And I also like the implication that Sally, being a very good mom, like my mom, Barbara Schubert, who is very caught up on the newest Olympian and always calls me to make sure she's reading the right chapters and stuff. Aww. God, I love how into the podcast and the book series my mom is. I like the implication that Sally is going to consume the Percy content because now there's some sort of lore of what is the narration? We get that this narration is happening after the fact. We don't know how long after the fact is Percy writing a book. Is this going to be like the Lord of the Rings right at the end? It's the big book that Sam yeah, wrote. Yeah, there's a frame story tacked onto the end. Yeah. Yeah. Is there going to be some sort of... Is it in The Princess Bride where we go outside of it and it's actually old Percy reading a bedtime story to the granddaughter of him that descended from him and Annabeth getting together and then having a kid? Like, I'm very intrigued, even if they don't reveal what the narration is because it's still just a book and it's just the telling of it. I like the introduction that there is some sort of world in which Sally is reading the Sea of Monsters and of course she would because she's such a supportive mother. She would absolutely do that. Yes. She'd be horrified but she would do it. <laughs> yes. Now, Camp Half-Blood looks fine on the surface, but there is an air of danger. There's less fun camp stuff going on and more defense prep going on. There is a quote from narrator Percy where he says, somebody had messed with my favorite place in the world and I was not, dot, 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 well, a happy camper. Uh, and oh, such a good dad. I love that Rick Riordan never thinks he's too good to include a dad joke. He is not above a dad joke. This is top notch, top tier. Oh, happy. Ca- oh, it's mm, because mm. Percy knows because Percy yeah. knows he's making a dad mm-hmm, joke mm-hmm. and he does it anyway. It's phenomenal. Chef kiss, chef kiss, chef kiss. Uh. Percy says that the kids are less friendly and overall it feels more like a military school. And he says that he's had experience with those because, because he's, been, he's been kicked out of them. <laughs> he's been kicked out of a few before. Yeah. I, I don't know what going to a military school would be like. I will take Percy's word for it. The closest I would know is I've seen Cadet Kelly, the Disney Channel original movie. And I just assume they're all like that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I have no experience with military academies and I have not seen Cadet Kelly on the Disney Channel. It is quite the film. It does have the powerhouse combo of Hilary Duff and Chrissy Carlson Romano, both at the peak of their powers. At peak even Stevens, Chrissy Carlson Romano and peak Lizzie McGuire, Hilary Duff Mm -hmm. together in a film. And though she's not playing Lizzie McGuire, she is basically playing Lizzie McGuire. Okay, okay, yeah. (laughs) And even though Chrissy Carlson Romano is not playing whatever her character's name on Even Stevens is, she's basically playing the same character. And they start out as rivals, and I won't give away a spoiler of it, but there is a dance battle in the military school, and it is very important to the plot. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Where are the dance battles in Percy Jackson? This is what I want to know. Gosh. Oh, I really hope so. Maybe one of the spinoffs. HBO, get on this. Cast people in things that are basically playing their characters in other things and force them to interact. I'm here for this. (laughs) I like that that movie is basically just kind of like the Super Smash Brothers, but of movies. where You're just pulling people from different franchises and then they're all going at it. So Tyson is very wowed by the camp. Percy starts to explain things to him, but also to the person who's reading book two and hasn't read book one, but still in a way that doesn't feel like a slog. 
Percy explains the big three situation to Tyson as well as the Thalia situation, and the narrator Percy says that he's just trying his best to avoid Thalia's fate, and then he wonders what Poseidon would turn him into if he was on the verge of death. Perhaps <laughs> plankton or a floating patch of kelp. <laughs> you can just run through any insult that Annabeth has given to him, and that is what Percy would turn into. Yeah, one of those jellyfish, but not one of the cool ones, the ones that Mm-mm. show up in the Jersey Shore where it's just a bunch of small ones that don't even move that are just there. I don't know what type of jellyfish that is. I'm sure someone will email me about what type of jellyfish (laughs) that is, but those were always my least favorite jellyfish because I would be going to the Jersey Shore, very excited to go boogie boarding or skimboarding or both, and then I wouldn't go in the water because those jellyfish are gross, or you'd have to go way, way, way deep out into the water to avoid them. Not a jellyfish fan. TNO is a very anti-jellyfish podcast. So they go into the big house, and they see Chiron packing up his room. Devastating. Devastating. Oh, nice. (laughs) Jinx, there's no other word to say for this. It is is brutal. It's so sad. It is so sad. Percy and Annabeth are distraught, and Chiron starts to explain that he's basically the fall guy. Zeus got incredibly upset, and Mr. D had to put someone to blame, and Percy interjects, besides himself, you mean? Love this. Love that. Love this. The righteous anger. It's great. Annabeth thinks that the whole situation is absolutely wild, and Chiron says that some in Olympus don't trust him now, quote, given the circumstances, which Chiron... Dum, dum, dum. (laughs) The way Chiron speaks, I feel like he is just always saying, how can I speak in the most ominous way possible at all times? (laughs) It's true. Like, at first, before I knew Chiron's whole deal, I thought, maybe I'm just reading into what Chiron's saying. No. Chiron knows exactly what he's doing, and he's doing it at all points in time. Everything he says is targeted and planned, and there is an exact reason why he says every sentence that he says. He chooses his words so carefully. I like to think that, like, as sort of language was becoming more modern, he was willing to let go of, like, the haths and shalls and whatever, but I need to speak with incredible portent. Yes, 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 yes. How can I always foreshadow? Exactly. How do I make that happen? (laughs) Percy asks what circumstances, and Chiron ignores him. Classic Chiron! (laughs) Tyson calls him a pony and looks like he wants to pet the pony, but is scared, which I guess is a slight improvement over touching Annabeth's hair, but not much more than that. And Chiron corrects him, my dear Cyclops, I'm a centaur. And this line in particular, I do know that I have said that I think that Stanley Tucci should be cast as Hades. I also think Stanley Tucci could be a great Chiron. He'd be a great Chiron. He'd be a great Chiron here because... I feel like we got a little bit of nurturing Stanley Tucci in The Hunger Games. We've seen it. I watched Stanley Tucci's travel thing on CNN of all channels. Stanley Tucci discovering Italy or finding Italy, whatever it was. How How do you not love him? He's amazing. He's an incredibly versatile actor, but still like sort of pulls your heart in no matter what he is doing. Yes. Even if he's just eating food. It's like, I want to eat that food, too. And also, and maybe this is part of his charm, too. When I am 50 years old, if I'm in a position where I could dress exactly like Stanley Tucci does, oh, my God. That would mean I did things right. Because his overcoat game, his sweater game, his turtleneck game. His sweater game is sharp. Very strong. Very strong stuff. And I would hope if I ever start to lose my hair and I decide to go bald, because that is the first thing I will do if I start to recede. I'm not Costanzaing. I'm full-fledged Tucciing. I would hope I could look as good bald as Stanley Tucci does because he is a powerful bald man. That is really the only bar for him being Chiron. It's like it's a statement to have a bald centaur. Like, how does that work? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess how is Mr. Brunner's hair described? Do they say he has a beard and then, like, short, scruffy hair? Yeah, no, he has short, scruffy hair is, I think, the vibe. Okay, all right. Well, my envisionment for Mr. Brunner is just, like, tweed jacket. Yeah. And I feel like Tucci could rock that for sure. But just the way he said this with the correction of I'm a centaur, it felt like I could hear my man Stanley Tucci (laughs) saying those words. Well, (laughs) I'll just have to see if he ends up in the movies. 
Percy asks what happened with the tree, and Chiron says that it's got to be something from the underworld. It has to be venom, and it's venom the likes of which I've never seen before. And he starts to say, it must be someone from the depths of Tartarus. And before he can even finish the word Tartarus, Percy interjects and says, well, clearly it's Cro." But before he can finish the word Kronos, Chiron tells him, do not invoke his name. Percy, not very good about this. Has not learned. He's never very good about it, is he? No, he's not. And I wouldn't be either. I would be very upset like Percy is. Or come on, why can't I just say his name? Come on, what's it going to change? Percy is convinced that it's Luke and Kronos together. And Chiron says that regardless of who's behind it, I have been fired because I didn't prevent it and I can't cure it. Unless, but then he brushes this off as a foolish train of thought that he shouldn't go down well he knows exactly what he's doing he's got percy and annabeth wrapped around his hoof yes i guess about his forelock i don't know horse terminology i don't know what is a horse finger <laughs> isn't that a thing that horse legs are more like fingers i feel like i've heard I that have before no like clue, the bone genuinely. structure of horse legs are, i think are more similar to fingers i feel like i've heard something gross about that before but i don't know <laughs> Chiron continues, only one source of magic would be strong enough to reverse the poison, and it was lost centuries ago. Obviously, Percy asks, what is this, saying that they will go and find it. And this is just Jedi mind trick, mm -hmm. Dumbledore, I've got you in the palm of my hands kind of stuff. He knows exactly what he is doing here to Percy, and it's so <laughs> funny to read. It's phenomenal, because you either have to believe that Chiron is naive enough to like be thinking aloud all of these thoughts or the truth, which is that he has been waiting for Annabeth and Percy to show up so that he can do this thing he scripted three days ago. Yeah, to conveniently be packing the exact day that they are leaving, because clearly this decision didn't just come down. No. I feel like this tree has been hurting for a while. I feel like he has certainly intentionally waited to say this stuff out loud for yeah. this crowd. So Chiron tells Percy, just stay here and train and don't leave. And I'm thinking here, is this reverse psychology? Because Percy's totally going to leave <laughs> if you're telling him to stay. Chiron says that Percy cannot be baited into hasty action by Kronos. This almost happened last year. Can't let it happen this year. Narrator Percy does a great job of recapping the whole Kronos deal in a fun way because he basically frames it as a, you'd have thought that Kronos would have learned his lesson after getting chopped up into millions of pieces into Tartarus. You would have thought he learned after messing with Ares, blah, 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 blah. It's very well done. I thought this was another level of recap in a fun way. It's a great recap strategy because anytime you have to sort of release a lot of exposition, the best thing to do is to give it to a character who has strong opinions so that it comes out as like Percy's critique of Kronos or like Percy joking about Kronos because then it doesn't feel like we're learning things. It feels like we're just listening to Percy. I'm now realizing that every script I've read written by you <laughs> for the voice acting things I've done with you have done this. Wow. Writing lessons with Sarah Shack. <laughs> This podcast is now educational in a different way. Hey. Percy is absolutely convinced that it's Kronos. And by the Hades book one principle, I am now thinking it is certainly not Kronos. It's got to be someone else. Or at the very least, it's another Kronos working with someone else kind of thing. Right. Or it's more complicated in some way. Yeah. It's not just him. It could be somebody that is doing Kronos' bidding. I don't necessarily have a big swing guess at this point in time, but I feel like it could be someone who is using the Cyclops as a way to do their bidding, whether that is Kronos directly or some other god. And I'm doing this mainly just because from what we know from the Grover dream plus the book cover, I feel like Cyclops are going to come into play, yeah. especially now with Tyson here. So that's all I've got. I have no sort of guess. I don't know. Like, is Thanatos in these books? I don't know. I'm trying to think <laughs> of other people in the underworld. <laughs> that's fair. I'm interested that you don't feel that Luke is involved in any way. Oh, I'm sure he is. I feel like he's going to be involved in any sort of Kronos thing at a minor level, but I feel like there's going to be someone else. I don't feel like we're going to have a situation where Luke is primary bad guy. I feel like Luke is just going to be eternal henchman mm -hmm. where he is just always involved, but he's not the dude. I don't think he's powerful enough. It feels like you have to be God or beyond God, whatever like Kronos is. Like actual God tier or Titan yeah, yes, tier, Yes, literal God, yeah. God tier or above Titan tier. You have to be that level to really be the villain. I feel like right. Luke is just going to always be there. Luke's the guy you fight before you fight one final boss. Luke is the Riku of Kingdom Hearts in the first <laughs> Kingdom Hearts game where you fight him and then you have to fight more evil. I appreciate that You have that to fight reference. Ansem. 
<laughs> so Chiron tells Annabeth to stay with Percy and tells her, remember the prophecy and keep him safe. And then Percy says, um, would this be the super dangerous prophecy that has me in it, but the gods have forbidden you to tell me about? And then narrator Percy says, no one answered. And then Percy goes, right, just checking. And that is... I, I'm trying not to be too full of myself. Thankfully, a bunch of other people have told me that some of the things Percy says remind them of me. This is one of the more Mike Schubert things to be said. <laughs> I would completely say this. No, it's a total improv guy, like reframing yeah, technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. So Annabeth then is talking to Chiron. She says, Chiron, you told me the gods made you immortal only so long as you were needed to train heroes. If they dismiss you from camp, and that is a great point to raise up that idea did not even think about. And once she said it, I thought, oh no. But then Chiron, in a classic Chiron move, doesn't really address it. He just says, swear you will do your best to keep Percy from danger. Swear upon the river Styx. So then Annabeth hesitates a bit. She goes, I, I swear it upon the river Styx. And then thunder rumbles outside. So I don't know the implications of swearing oh, this... on the river Styx, but clearly it's a big deal. Yeah, seems like it's a big deal. Yeah. Chiron then says, very well, perhaps my name will be cleared and I shall return. Until then, I go to visit my wild kinsman in the Everglades, Florida. Sure. Okay. Centaurs in the Everglades. Let's go. I mean, as we've discussed on this podcast, very much a Northeast trope to live in the Northeast and then retire in Florida. Chiron is a snowbird. <laughs> it's amazing. But this trip does have a purpose because Chiron says that maybe they know of some sort of cure for the poison tree. But he's got to stay there until the issue is resolved one way or another. Annabeth starts to hold back a sob. Chiron pats her shoulder awkwardly, saying, there now, child, I must entrust your safety to Mr. D. Don't have very high hopes for this. Don't have high hopes at all. <laughs> and then he talks about the new activities director, and then he just does not give a vote of confidence. He says, hopefully they'll just not screw things up. Percy then asks, yeah, right, who is Tantalus? And why does he have your job? Where does he get the nerve? And then... Before this can get answered, which, like, this happens in every Chiron conversation, even when it's not Chiron doing it, there's a conch horn that blows in the distance across the valley, and yeah. that means it's meal time. so Chiron tells them just to go, you'll meet this person at the pavilion, he says he's going to talk to Sally, and he's going to let her know that Percy is safe, obviously she's going to be worried, he yep. again reiterates his warning to not be hasty. Otherwise, Percy will be in danger. He says, do not think for a moment that the Titan Lord has forgotten you. So very much warning. Kronos is still very much upset at you. This wasn't yep. just over with book one ending. And then Harry to Percy says, with that, he clopped out of the apartment and down the hall. Tyson calling after him, pony, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> Clop is such a good verb. <laughs> Clopped out is very, very good. Chiron will live as long as he can get out of a conversation without being direct. That is like, actually his life It's not force. about training heroes, guys. <laughs> As long as you can be foreshadowing and never answer direct questions in the purpose of the plot of a book, yep. you can survive. Yeah, Absolutely. maybe Kyron has a deal with Rick Riordan where he says, as long as you say enough but not too much to where my books are still interesting, you can survive forever. You can stay, yeah. Once Chiron leaves, though, this is when Percy realizes, oh, crap, I never told him about my Grover dream. I didn't get to ask him any questions. It's too late now. I don't know if I'm ever going to see Chiron again. You're for sure going to see Chiron again. There's no way he's gone forever. <laughs> and then I didn't see this happening, but I just wanted to hug Tyson even more. He starts bawling, almost as bad as Annabeth. He starts just crying his eyes out. And Percy wants to say that everything's going to be okay. And Percy starts to say everything's going to be okay, but he doesn't believe it. And on this, unfortunately, very sad note, we're going to stop here. And that's the end of this episode of The Just Olympian. But a very sad, but like a mature note, like good yes. on Percy. Sometimes you just have to like sit in that sadness mm -hmm. and just be there with people who are sad. It's yeah. it's tough, but like, oh, doesn't sound like everything's going to be OK, guys. No, it is super hard. And Percy has had similar thoughts where he doesn't feel great about lying. And specifically in this book earlier to Tyson, he said everything was going to be okay. And then as the narrator just thinks, I couldn't promise that. I, and he immediately How felt guilty. How could I promise that? Yeah. Exactly. So for him to think about this here really shows maturity. And it's something that I'm always trying to get better at because I usually try to problem solve. And that's not always what people need. Like you said, sometimes people just need to be sad and you just need to be sad for a little bit. And that's okay. And, you know, this is a sad point of the book here. But is a good stopping point, but also, I mean, we're at a very interesting point, and I have not read past years, so I don't know exactly what's going on, but I think 
we've got quite a bit of interesting stuff on our hands. There's quite a bit of interesting stuff ahead. Yes. Absolutely. So, Sarah, thank you again so much for joining. I very much appreciate it. If people want to find you doing stuff, where can they find you? Oh, my gosh. It has been my absolute pleasure, Mike. You can find me on the on the Twitter. I'm at Sarah Shackett. I post things that I do there. So come hang out. Yes, do it. The stuff that Sarah Shackett does is good. And not just the stuff that I'm involved in. Wolf Although 15... the stuff that Mike Schubert is in is very, very good. <laughs> but real talk, Wolf 359 was one of my first introductions to podcasts, and I absolutely blitzed through that so quickly. Amazing. I would be plowing through episodes to and from commutes when I was an engineer in Seattle. I ate that up so quickly, and I'm nice. so glad that we happened to be invited to the same pool party That's that right. one time. <laughs> <laughs> became friends. It was an excellent pool party and I'm what glad that it happened. Yep. I am as well. So, Sarah, thank you for joining. Listeners, thank you for listening. And until we learn what the heck all of this Chiron foreshadowing is, I'll proceed you later. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The New Stolympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanes and Brandon Google, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you're all caught up on the show and you don't know what to do, first, you could go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon, join the Patreon, and get access to a bunch of bonus content, bonus episodes, director's commentary, and more. Or you can follow the show on social media. We're at New Stolympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We've got a subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash The New Stolympian, and the Patreon gets you access to the patron exclusive Discord. Speaking of that Patreon, I want to thank our producer level patrons Lada Bartova, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Emma Cooey, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Hoskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Natanya Page, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Tough Bayfong, Moo Moo Productions, Don't Call Me Nymphadora, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Griffin Dork, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Minka Dreesen, Can't I See We Brain, Matt Barger, Peter Johnson the Twin, Sabrina Balsiger, Mooney B, Bony Pony, Harlan Christ, Heather McMillan, Casey Canales, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lauer, Aiden Lippold, Josh Sayer, Percy Blue, Josh Wilkey, Martin Anvik, Abby Ryan, Josh Clements, Angela MF, Mary Baumgartner, Shannon Yvonne is Aguilar, Wise Girl, Alpacas or Hope, Finn TZ, Ribbon Monstrosity, Samantha McNamara, Tate Sasson, Emil Oscar Thomason, Roxas 1912, Rafaela, Ashton Gabrielson, Cara Moren, Marco Redhouse, Falcon, Joey James, Christopher William Boucher, Justin Lux, and Caden Mack. If you want to support the show non monetarily, spreading it via word of mouth goes such a long way. If you think of someone that would like the show, why don't you reach out to them directly and say, hey, there's this podcast called The New Olympian. I think you would like it. Or you can just post about the show on social media or leave us a rating interview on whatever podcast app you're using. All of these things really help. And I'm very appreciative to those of you who decide to do so. But I just think it's very cool that you listen to this episode. And I hope you tune into our next episode. We're going to be finishing chapter five with special guest Caleb Denicor. It's going to be a great time. But until then, I'll see you later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Mike. I'm recording this on March 2nd, and I'm about to get on a plane tomorrow morning to fly to Nashville, Tennessee for a Potter Hills Live show. And I just wanted to give some plane advice. I've been flying a lot and just wanted to give some, some advice here. First, I would highly recommend wearing very comfortable clothes and not being concerned with what people think of your outfit. It's the airport. Nobody really cares. Dress for comfort, for sure. I like to wear very breathable socks because my feet like expand on the plane and stuff. So having some nice, breathable, moisture-wicking socks can really go a long way. I also I'm a big tray table sleeper. I think this is an underrated sleeping on plane. People try to either lean back or recline the seat or lean on their arm or something, but I've actually found a lot of success with tray table sleeping. I recommend that you get one of those big water bottles, like a Nalgene or something, because you can show up to the airport with it empty and then fill it up, and then boom, you've got water the whole flight. You don't have to wait on the drink service or whatever, because they just give you those tiny little cups. Ugh. But if you do order something, you got to get ginger ale, because ginger ale scientifically tastes better in the air. You can look it up online. It's great. But anyway, I've been ASMR Mike, and you've been wonderful. Thank you so much for listening.